the Johansson Farm in central Kansas. Please. Greg Johansson starts the day by feeding his family. But his job is to feed the world. American agriculture, from seed to shelf, is so efficient, most people don't think much about it. But growing food is a sophisticated business. Employing science, computer-guided ground-shaking machinery, and sometimes controversial techniques. American farmers generate $200 billion of produce annually, providing the U.S. with the most plentiful food basket and least expensive food bill in the world. Well, certainly having a, a safe and affordable and abundant food supply is critical to the national security of this country. We've never had to go to war for a shortage of food uh, like most countries of the world have. So it gives a, our country kind of a leg up that we are a food sufficient society. The farmer's job is complex. Feed the world, protect the environment, provide inexpensive food, stay in business. Greg manages 3,000 acres. His hours depend on the needs of the land and the crops it produces. You know, it's basically your typical farm operation in this part of the country. Wheat, milo, beans, alfalfa, and beef cattle. Like the cycle of life of the crops that he grows, Greg is engaged in a never-ending repetition of preparation, planting, nurturing, and harvesting. In this program, we'll see just what Greg's yearly tasks are like. Greg starts by using a tractor and field conditioner to prepare his land for planting. The Johansson family's rich farming heritage dates back many generations. But the origins of farming date back 10,000 years. Agriculture allowed for everything. You couldn't have urban populations, you couldn't have stable populations without agriculture. Before that, people were chasing after animals, they were moving around a lot, or they were foraging. Ancient agronomists learned to break up the soil with digging sticks in preparation for seeding. Around 3500 BC, Egyptians created a wooden wedge-shaped implement, tipped with an iron share or blade to cut a trough in the earth. They hitched their plow to oxen. In the 11th century, Europeans added a moldboard behind the share to turn the soil over once it was broken. The plow does several things. First of all, it turns under crop residue. It opens up the soil. And uh, thirdly, uh, it, it's used for weed control. In the newly established United States, people expanded westward, displaced natives, and established homesteads. The rich soil in the Midwest prompted a design change of the ancient implement. The cast iron plows popular for the sandy soil back east just couldn't cut it. The problem was that the soil would stick to the plow and uh, they had to stop every so often and clean the dirt off of the moldboard before they could proceed. In 1837, John Deere, an Illinois blacksmith, found inspiration for a better plow when visiting a local sawmill. He noticed a broken steel saw blade that was highly polished from use. Deere took the saw blade and fashioned it into a plow. When finished, he went around demonstrating his plow's amazing properties. As it was pulled through the ground, the steel would polish and become very slick, and that sticky soil wouldn't stick to it. Well, this was quite a revolution in the development of the plow in that particular part of the country. By 1855, John Deere was selling 13,000 plows a year. The John Deere agricultural empire was born. In the mid-1800s, 55% of Americans lived on farms. 
farming was a backbreaking enterprise, even with the aid of horses. But a new invention would begin to change that. The tractor was probably the most significant agricultural innovation of the 20th century. The tractor allowed farmers to get rid of approximately 23 million draft animals, horses and mules. To feed these animals required approximately 80 million acres of cropland and another 80 million acres of pasture land. The first traction engines, or tractors, were steam powered. These monstrous machines were built like locomotives, burning coal, wood, or straw to produce steam that drove the wheels. They consumed enormous amounts of water and fuel, but produced relatively little power. For the most part, steam tractors stayed on the sidelines and ran stationary devices. But the role of the tractor began to change with the advent of the gasoline engine in the late 1800s. The company founded on polished steel plows expanded its product line. John Deere purchased the Waterloo Gasoline Traction Company in Waterloo, Iowa in 1918. And that was a tremendous move. They saw the future, of course, was going to be tractors powered by gasoline engines instead of horsepower. Weighing tons less, yet having comparable horsepower, the gasoline tractors snuffed out the fire-breathing steam engines and put a lot of animals out to pasture. In the 1920s and 30s, there were organized campaigns, quite substantial campaigns, trying to defend the horse and delay or stop the spread of the tractors. There was an organization called the Horse Association of America. One of the things the Horse Association of America did was they set up a lot of tests with uh, tractors and horses to show that horses were more efficient. And at least in some cases where the temperature was very hot, uh, they overworked their horses and the animals didn't survive the test. Tractors meant larger farms and fewer farmers. Tractors and plows shredded the prairie, helping to feed an increasing metropolitan population. But the combination of tractor, plow, and drought led to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. The plow broke the virgin sod and tight root structure that protected the underlying soil. The soil was now susceptible to the fierce prairie wind, leading to one of the greatest ecological disasters in history. Clouds of dust overtook 150,000 square miles of Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, New Mexico, and Kansas. The dirty 30s, the first time I remember, don't know what's coming up, but it sure is black. It was dust. In response, farmers looked for alternative implements that didn't leave the soil as vulnerable. New farming techniques, conservation efforts, and rain helped settle the dust. In the 20th century, the tractor became the cornerstone of farming. Manufacturers introduced improvements hydraulics to raise and lower machinery, power takeoffs to run equipment, and the luxury of a cab. The sound guard body was an integral part of the tractor which enclosed the operator. It kept the noise out, all fully air conditioned, tremendous visibility around the tractor. It really focused on operator comfort inconvenience. Costing more than $200,000, today's largest tractors run 425 horsepower diesel motors. Some even have tracks. Behemoth four-wheel drive. Nearly every comfort of home. Since farmers can spend 14 hours a day, six days a week on the tractor, it is home. People think it's boring when you're on a tractor. I mean, they think, well, you don't got nobody to talk to. When I get on a tractor, it's just peaceful. 
And I'm in there thinking about what you could do maybe next year. Greg Johansson's ground is conditioned and ready for seeding. His next task will be planting. Coming up, seed. As technologically amazing as the equipment, but a great deal more controversial. There are close to one billion acres of farmland in the United States. Farming technology will return on Modern Marvels. Greg Johansson manages the family farm with his two brothers, Mike and Tom. After tilling the land, it's planting season, and Greg readies his equipment to sow wheat. Greg's grain drill opens a small trench in the earth, drops seed at precise increments and at exact depths, then covers the seed with dirt. Greg's drill is just the latest incarnation of planting machinery and methods. By comparison to the plow, the planter is a relatively new invention. Uh, in fact, up into the 1800s, the planting of corn, for instance, was uh, still very labor-intensive. It involved an individual farmer carving a hole into the field with his hoe and then dropping individual seeds into those, uh, into those holes and recovering them. In the early 1700s, Jethro Tull, an English lawyer, invented a mechanical seed drill for planting. His device planted in neat rows for easy weeding and at a uniform depth, which Tull discovered was important to the health of the plant. Inventions like Tull's revolutionized the way people grew crops and cared for the ground. That environment farmer partnership endures today. You've got to take care of your land if the land's going to take care of you. That's the way I look at it. Greg's father, Robert, retired years ago. But like many aging farmers, he can't slow down. He's seen more than 50 years of change. They've bred better wheat. We've got better seed wheat. And you got fertilizer. Technological innovation hasn't been restricted to machinery. Arguably, the biggest change in agriculture came with the increased use of chemical fertilizer in the mid-20th century. As the crop grows, nutrients are depleted from the soil and must be replenished for a healthy crop next year. The concept is a very old one. Ancient Chinese used animal manure. The Romans used bird manure and garbage compost. Native Americans taught the pilgrims how to grow maize by burying a fish beside the planted seeds. In 1842, an English agriculturalist, John Laws, produced phosphate fertilizer by breaking down animal bones with sulfuric acid. After World War I, Companies producing synthetic nitrate for explosives shifted to making nitrogen fertilizer. In the 1950s, companies introduced inexpensive fertilizers which ignited a green revolution. Yields skyrocketed. I used some fertilizer on my own ground and uh, had a little left and so I had some rented ground and the landlord wasn't too enthused about using it, you know, paying for it. So I just finished what I had left and made an X out there in the field and uh, didn't say nothing to him until the following year. And when we got ready to cut a wheat, why, he asked what that was. And you could see it from quite a little ways off. And when you went through it with the combine, you could sure see more grain come in the bin as he was going through that X. After that, why, he was all enthused about using fertilizer. In the decades that followed the introduction of inexpensive fertilizers, yields tripled. And more food has historically been the goal of agriculture. But fertilizer wasn't the only reason for higher yields. Seed changed. Hybrid corn introduced in the 1920s produced bigger bounties. The ancestor of corn is called Teosinti. This is what corn was before our foremothers got a hold of it 
10, 15,000 years ago. And over, you know, 15 millennia of artificial selection, they turned this into this. In today's biotechnological world, scientists can alter plant characteristics almost overnight. Genetically modified, or GM crops, result from a technology that is as controversial as it is powerful. Scientists now move specific genes from one organism into another. Some of the genes that we're putting into plants uh, come from organisms that are not plants, come from animals or bacteria. Why is that uh, possible? Why is that not unnatural? Well, it's possible because DNA, nucleic acids, are the language of life, and that's a virtually universal language. Every organism on the planet uses these compounds to encode their hereditary characteristics. There's nothing in a gene which says, I belong in a strawberry, I belong in a fish. If found in a corn plant, you know, uh, please return to owner. I mean, the, the, the living world isn't like that. Proponents of the new technology promise higher yielding crops, decreased reliance on chemical pesticides and herbicides, and plants with higher nutritional values. It's not a substitute for working on poverty and the other issues that, uh, that are causing people to be malnourished. But if you have only a limited budget and you have to eat a certain type of commodity and we can modify it in such a way that has higher nutrition, uh, it seems really uh, virtually immoral not to do it. I mean, why not do that? Seed companies swear to the benefits and safety of GM food. But opponents call them Frankenfoods. Concerned groups believe there could be unforeseen health risks, including the accidental introduction of unknown allergens into common food. The development of regulations and the widespread use of genetically modified crops is going ahead at a rate much faster than our ability to assess the risks associated with it. In fact, there's very little um, good risk assessment that has been done in terms of understanding some of the ecological consequences of the material that is already very widely grown, never mind the next generations that are getting ready to um, be put into production. Of course, we have to be sure they're safe. We have to te test that. But uh, they're certainly as safe as uh, the genetic engineering we've been doing for the last hundred years. The debate regarding genetically modified foods may be heated, but with more than 45 GM crops on the market, chances are you're consuming them right now. Back at the farm, Greg Johansson's crop is growing. It's the most vulnerable time of the year. A host of assailants could wipe out his hard work. 35% of corn and 55% of soybeans produced in the U.S. in 1999 were genetically modified. Farming technology will return on Modern Marvels. Greg Johansson has completed planting his crops. But he doesn't sit back and wait for harvest. As the crops grow, Greg's battling insects, weeds, and even the weather. You can have a perfect year growing and you think you've got it made and in an hour time a hailstorm's got you completely gone you know it's completely gone there's no business uh, that is more prone to natural disaster than agriculture i mean you know just imagine if you ran a business outside with with items that you were producing that could be destroyed overnight it could be a flood a hurricane a tornado a hailstorm or a drought if the weather doesn't get greg's crops Insects might. Pests just... Some of the chemicals that they dealt with were really toxic. You know, they were using arsenic pretty freely on trees. I always like to be out there spraying arsenic around, and all you have to protect yourself is a little handkerchief over your mouth. In the mid-20th century, scientists created extremely effective chemical herbicides to kill weeds and pesticides to kill insects. Yields jumped. One of the most infamous pests, 1.2 billion pounds of DDT between 1950 and 1972. In 1948, Dr. Mueller won a Nobel Prize for his work. The benefits of DDT were obvious. 
But the properties that made DDT work so well as a pesticide also made it an environmental poison. DDT is easily absorbed and is slow to break down in the soil. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, reported DDT killed fish and birds. Other studies linked DDT to cancer. Her bestseller prompted a White House report calling for new federal regulation. Finally, in 1972, the U.S. government banned DDT. But the overuse of other chemicals produced similar negative effects. I think we're in trouble. We really are. And I, sometimes I think we need just to back up a little bit, take it a little bit slower, remember what our parents taught us, and not go overboard on this pesticide bit. Today, most farmers hire licensed professionals to apply the pesticide and herbicide products that regulatory agencies deem safe. Ironically, the same companies that make pesticides and herbicides are creating genetically modified crops that require less chemical. Seed companies introduced corn that generates its own pesticide. Derived from a soil bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt corn cells are toxic to the corn borer pests that eat it. You no longer have to spray to eliminate that insect. And most of those insecticides are the ones that we really don't want to fool with. We don't want the residues in the crop. It's a boon to me and it's a boon to the consumer. Seed companies also promote herbicide-resistant soybeans that require less herbicide. But like other GM issues, there's debate. There is a great number of, uh, of unanswered questions here. This technology has not been tested, uh, irregardless of what uh, FDA and EPA have put a rubber stamp on. They used, uh, for the most part, information that the genetic engineering companies supplied to them. Environmental watchdogs worry about insects developing resistance to genetic pesticides, killing non-target insects, or cross-pollination between GM plants and weeds, producing uncontrollable herbicide-resistant weeds. Furthermore, there's concern about gene patents granted to the seed companies. I think biotechnology can provide a way to produce crops with less water, less energy, less pesticides. But I also think we've got to do a very good job of regulating this to protect public health and the environment as well. And I think you can do both. An alternative to GM food is organic. Organic foods are non-genetically modified crops grown without chemical fertilizer, pesticide, or herbicide. The demand for organic foods has doubled in the last 10 years. The University of California, Santa Cruz, runs one of the oldest organic research departments in the U.S. Here, researchers develop non-chemical techniques to help farmers grow crops and control pests. A lot of it is about managing the farm habitat to encourage uh, beneficial insects that will suppress the populations of, of pests. And that may involve planting particular crops next to each other. It may involve planting uh, particular vegetation around field margins. I think as a society, we have to think about how to encourage farming practices that don't cause environmental problems and find a way of encouraging farmers to use those, even if it costs more, um, so that we don't, as a society, then face the costs of cleaning up the problems later. Applying that research is Mark Marino. Mark works for Earthbound Farm. Their 10,000 acres represent one of the largest organic farms in the U.S. Without the aid of chemicals, organic farming requires a lot more attention and manpower than conventional farming. Mark applies 20 to 30 tons of compost per acre every year to fertilize the earth. Plants are like people. If you have a good diet, you will not be as susceptible to uh, flu bugs or cold germs. And uh, plants are very much like that. If you can 
feed the soil and make a smorgasbord of really nice nutrients in the soil that the plant can take in, then they will be healthy and they will not have the tendency to be sick. And that's what the bugs attack, the sick ones. It's survival of the fittest. Organic products make up about 1% of the market. Prices tend to be higher, but many consumers are willing to pay for their personal peace of mind. Even if it tastes better and seems safer, some say organic farming can't produce the inexpensive food an expanding world requires. Although banned in the United States, approximately two dozen countries continue to use DDT to control malaria. Farming technology will return. The Johansson brothers prepare the combine, a giant machine used for harvesting grain. They're fortunate. It looks like a bumper crop. Harvest my one paycheck for the whole year. I mean, you've worked all year long to put it in, to watch over it, and, you know, pray over it that the weather doesn't take it from you. And the end result is what you have in the bin. Green farmers in the Midwest rely on big equipment for the job. This $150,000 combine is a food processing plant on wheels, cutting, threshing, and cleaning grain in one slick operation. The machine devours 36-foot swaths of grain, reeling it in and shearing the stalks. The cut grain enters the bowels of the machine, where beater heads pound the seed from the stock. Vibrating sieves send grain to a holding bin, while refuse is passed out the back. The operator rides in the cab of the combine, where a host of sensors tell him everything from shaft speed to bin volume. Driving a combine in harvest, it's probably the most important job out there. Um, you've got to watch how high you're cutting so you're not missing anything. You're taking anywhere from 20 to 30 foot swath. If your field's not flat, if you've got terraces, you, you're constantly keeping, trying to keep one end out of the ground. It's, um, it's pretty hairy at times. The modern combine didn't appear until the early 20th century. Before that, the three functions, cutting, threshing, and cleaning, were done with separate devices. Uh, reaping is an activity that's been around since antiquity. Early farmers used uh, flint-bladed knives uh, to, to cut the stalks of grain. Uh, they uh, evolved eventually into a forward-angled sickle, which was used to, uh, to separate the, uh, the stalk from the, from the head. And it uh, eventually evolved into the, the scythe. The scythe was a blade and long handle. Eventually, farmers attached cradles to the scythes to catch wheat, increasing productivity. A person came behind the scythe and manually bound wheat into sheaves for threshing. The back-breaking work had remained basically the same for thousands of years. But the farmer got a break when Cyrus McCormick introduced his mechanical reaper in the 1830s. The horse-drawn device mowed down wheat using a reciprocating saw. A man manually raked the wheat off the back where it would be gathered and sheaved by another person. Mechanization revolutionized harvesting, but McCormick's device only cut the wheat. The next step involved separating the grain from the straw. Farmers in the mid-1800s started using a mechanical thresher that reduced labor even more. The thresher had a series of rotating teeth that stripped the seed from the stalk. And J.I. Case was really instrumental in the development of the threshing machine. This thresher initially was powered by human power, in other words, by turning a crank. But one of the things that uh, Case developed was the uh, utilization of animal power. Animals, horses on a treadmill or oxen on a treadmill. The Case Company continued improving threshing technology. Steam-powered threshing machines were prevalent into the 1930s. 
Men fed cut wheat into the thresher, which mechanically beat the grain free from the straw. Sieves and a fan separated grain from chaff, expelling straw out one end and grain out the other. Farming took one more gigantic leap forward with the invention of the combined harvester thresher, a machine capable of both cutting and separating. Combine saved a heck of a lot of work, a heck of a lot of work, because when you're using a steam engine and a thrashing machine, there's about 11 people with that thrashing machine, so there'd be quite a crew around. The first combines in the late 1800s were horse-drawn. It took an enormous amount of power to pull the complicated mechanisms. All of the cutting, threshing, and separating functions depended on gearing, attached to the wheels. Forty animals might be used. Tractor power made things easier in the 1900s, and around 1910, manufacturers introduced self-propelled combines. A crew of 10 to 15 people was replaced by one man and one machine. The combine had an effect on the farm similar to the tractor. Farm size grew while farm population shrank. More people moved off the farm and into the city. In the 20th century, combines became more comfortable, sophisticated, and productive. We have combines today that are just absolutely magnificent machines. They're factories on wheels that run through the field harvesting 12 rows of corn at a time or have a 36-foot platform to direct cut wheat or grain. A lot of these combines move across North America with uh, custom harvesters or contract harvesters that harvest the crops. Custom cutters are wandering bands of men and machines who spend as much as nine months a year cutting grain for hire. Following the progression of harvest from Texas north into Canada. The allure of the uh, nomadic part of it wears off pretty soon with the uh, grind of uh, what's it like not to be at home, uh, what's it like to live in a travel trailer. The average crew maintains two to six combines with matching grain trucks and trailers. An outfit might have more than one million dollars of equipment. Custom cutters swoop into an area, cut for a few days, then move north into a new region. In a flash, the grain's cut and they're ready to go. Now you load this combine on a trailer. The combine weighs over 20,000 pounds. Uh, the truck weighs 20,000 pounds. The trailer weighs 10,000 pounds. The tires on the combine, even after you've taken the header off, are 14 feet wide just a mass of kinetic energy just waiting for an accident if you will most farmers own a combine and cut their own grain the machinery is expensive and commodity prices are low for every dollar spent at the grocery store the farmer only gets 10 to 20 cents farmers have to manage more acreage to make a profit and smaller farmers are finding it harder and harder to survive. You have a bumper crop and then you turn around and look at the price of the crop and you're wondering how you're going to make it to the next one. And that's the big letdown is knowing that you don't have any more money than you had a year ago. You hopefully stretching enough to pay the bills. It's been a good yet exhausting year on the Johansson farm. But Greg can't rest. He's already back in the tractor preparing for the coming planting season and looking forward to next year. Every year, equipment and technology change. Greg's neighbor already has the latest global positioning system and computer yield monitor. Greg knows to survive, he'll have to invest as well. Coming up, preparing for next season as Future Tech hits the farm. In 1900, 41% of the U.S. population were farmers. Today, 2% farm the land. 
Farming technology will return. The Johansson brothers are finishing harvest. They're taking the final loads of wheat to the grain elevator. Rising from the flat prairie landscape stand tall white storage structures that can hold 200 million pounds of grain. Grain is unloaded and stored until food companies buy it to make bread, crackers, or pizza crust. Greg sells his wheat and keeps track of income versus operating expenses on a computer. Like the rest of the world, farming has undergone a technological revolution in the last 20 years. Greg's neighbor, Lee Scheifler, gets an electronic map of the nutrient requirements of the field as they vary within the field. This is a prescription specifically for that field that tells you that the northwest corner gets more fertilizer than the southwest corner. So the rate is continually changing. The application rate will be changing automatically based on this map, this computer, and GPS. Lee also uses GPS during harvest. His yield monitor, which tells how much grain he's cutting, is compared against his GPS location. The yield monitor is the report card, if you will. Uh, how did this field perform, not on a whole field basis, which we gather by simply weighing everything that went off the field, but how did it perform in different areas of the field? I always knew there was variability until I actually saw that measured. I didn't realize how much. If the tractor has a map of a field, and with GPS knows where it is within the field, why can't the tractor run itself? Trimble Navigation is making that a reality. The autopilot system allows for satellite navigated control of the tractors going across the field. It takes control of the steering and the hydraulics so that the operator has a hands-off uh, operation where the guidance just takes over and runs the tractor by itself. This frees the operator up to monitor the equipment, reduces stress, and makes it fun to operate that tractor in the cab. The Trimble system is accurate down to an inch. But a person can't just point the tractor in the direction of the field and let it go. The sophisticated system is designed to help the operator drive straight lines. That first line then is set between the A point at the beginning, the B point as the finish. Then each subsequent pass will be parallel to that first line. Benefits to driving straight lines would include the operator's ability to drive even at night. Chemicals are more efficiently applied because there are no gaps or double coverage between passes. Every technological innovation is helping farmers produce more food. What's easy to forget is that we live in a very unusual age in which Americans, for the most part, do not worry about starvation on their doorstep. You don't have to go back very far in history in which most people were worried about where they were going to get enough to eat, and famines were a regular fact of life in now developed countries like Western Europe. Uh, and it's also easy to forget that much of the world hasn't passed that threshold. We've seen all this technological change of the last 150 years, and particularly the last 50 years. I guess my view is that it's not going to stop. If anything, it's going to accelerate. Uh, this means that productivity is going to continue going up. It means that there will be fewer farmers. Farmers have to compete with non-farmers to keep their sons on the farm. And if they don't, it means the sons go off and become engineers and technicians and university professors. I just think that's a losing battle. After college, Greg was the only Johansson brother who came back to work full time on the farm. The farm couldn't support three families. Low farm prices led the others to pursue alternative careers. I didn't have enough for all three boys to each have a farm. I'd like to see every one of them being able to farm on his own, but there's just no way that it'll work. And whether it'll work after I'm gone, I don't know. That's up to them. 
Mike works evenings, weekends, and vacations on the farm. To him, the land is more than just a business venture. You know, it's hard to put into words. being, the Johansson family and others like them continue to farm, racing to keep abreast of the latest technology, working long hours in the dirt, caring about what they do, and feeding the world.